Okay, good evening, everyone. So just waiting for the last to arrive here. Thank you for coming so many. <laughs> it's all about dance. All the breathing. All about dance tonight, and we have a really amazing uh, series of guests here tonight and internal people. And I'm going to present them as I go through my introduction of the evening. Um, and I just want to make sure that you're all taking notes of all the questions that you want to ask these people here in the front. <laughs> I'll show you pictures of their faces so you can remember them. And then please also. Um, Welcome our director of the neuroscience department, Professor David Peppel, who will be good bad boy and bad boy <laughs> in the discussion, <laughs> trying to animate us a bit, help us a bit uh, to find out things about dance and especially about empirical aesthetics of dance. Um, could we just please all welcome our guests, Beatrice Calvo Merino, Luisa Sanchez Canero, and Ed Vessel. <laughs> Um, the talks are mostly 15 minutes. If someone runs over, we're all friends, we won't shout. Um, we'll try then to keep five minutes discussions, but there will be plenty of time to discuss afterwards, everyone together, and with some pretzels at the end as well. Um, so I thought I'd just set the stage a little bit about this kind of new uh, field of empirical research that is dance, uh, to start very basic. This is the Institute of Empirical Aesthetics, and what what we study here, our mis mission is to use scientific methods to explain the psychological, neurological and social cultural basis of aesthetic perceptions and judgments of observers to different art forms. And there are also, there's also dance in the house, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so this being a very interdisciplinary endeavor, we have people from many different disciplines joining forces, um, from anthropology, from experimental psychology, from dance, artists, film, um, basically a lot of disciplines, including also newer disciplines like neuroscience, trying to work together. Often what we need is a Rosetta Stone, so something to find a translation, because sometimes the same words are used for different things in the different disciplines. So I thought as they start very basic. So aesthetics is a philosophical discipline. It's very old. It describes aesthetic judgments like beauty, expressivity, or how moving something is when we look at art and empirical aesthetics or experimental aesthetics is a much younger discipline um, from the 19th century funded by Fechner um, and it seeks to study our aesthetic judgments with empirical methods. So now we want to study dance as well and we might need to define what dance is. So again, to clarify, what are we talking about? Aesthetics of dance is again a philosophical discipline that seeks to understand and study the aesthetic judgments that we make about dance as an art form. And empirical aesthetics of dance is a very young discipline, actually only 15 years, and we have some of the first endeavorers on this field here tonight. Um, that studies the judgments, the aesthetic judgments that people make about dance with empirical methods. So if someone said this is, says this is an aesthetic dance, what they mean in this context might be one of these, beautiful, likable, elegant, emotional, expressive, it's moving or it's sexy. <laughs> so it's many things. It's not as lay language someone under sometimes understands aesthetic as something just about the form. It's much more. Um, so then now, what is dance? Well, it's something you can look at. It's something that you might do. It's something that you might look and do at the same time. It's something you can do as a couple, as a group. Uh, it might be an art phone, though I don't know exactly how to divide that from the rest. It can be a form of self-expression. It can be a body language, a way how we talk to each other, how we communicate without verbal language. It can be a therapy, a type of mood regulation. It can be for seduction, a sort of a courtship ritual. It can be something that identifies me with my own culture or with some particular subculture. It can be an aerobic exercise that made me lose weight. Is Zumba a dance? I say yes. And 
most ancient probably the mention of dance as a form of spiritual enlightenment, a way of connecting with nature, with ourselves, and with, if we want to call it, some god. So that's dance. <laughs> it's something. Um, what do you think of my definition of dance? Dance can be, and actually is, many things at once. And that's what we study. We generally focus mostly on what people experience when they watch dance. And here we come with our scientific method. We systematize. Scientific method today is purple. As you can see, that's a joke. I'm Danish, you are allowed to laugh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, when we come with our scientific method, we try to systematize. We sometimes need to reduce. We need to take single aspects out and manipulate them for our experiments. But if I take a part out and I reduce it for my experiments, is that still dance? Well, I don't really know. But that's the good thing of this interdisciplinary field. Then we go and we talk to the dancers. And for example, today we have Luisa Sanchez Canero here with us, yes, <laughs> um, who is a dancer, a practitioner, one from inside, someone who has experienced being a dancer from very early in her life, and she's a very renowned um, practitioner herself and has worked with big names in the field as well. She's here to answer also questions and to give a talk in a moment. So it's important that we have this interdisciplinary exchange in our field. Um, I would like to give you some examples of types of experiments that have been done in this reductionist manner that we take out things from the dance and try to study it. For example, the visual features. So a series of studies have um, tried to isolate from the movement of a dance the shape that it draws in the visual space. And these studies have shown that if the body in space draws some round um, shapes or makes rounded trajectories in space. People prefer these movements, they like them more than if there's a lot of edgy stuff going on. Okay. Another series of studies is interested in whether observers for their aesthetic judgment get really influenced with the dance if the dance is really stretchy. So if the legs go here and <laughs> you make split jumps and all that. And it seems, yes, people really love it, especially lay audiences, when the dance is very stretchy. Cool. And then another set of studies with a very complex um, technology uh, using motion capture, looking at the kinematic properties of dance movements. And these researchers, they were very interested in finding out which male dance moves attract the female eye. So they found out that especially dancers using their right knee a lot um, were just as quite aesthetic and very attractive. So. Um, that's great. So now we are going to the discotheque tonight and we're all going to have rounded movements and like turn in rounds, not, nothing like this, no. And we're going to stretch our legs up here because that's what we all can do and we'll use the right leg, especially the guys, right? So, <laughs> um, okay, so what with this kind of evidence, um, what do we do with it? Is that, will choreographers now change <laughs> Luisa has eyes like that. No, choreographers will not change now because we're telling them this empirical evidence. But this illustrates another important point of our discipline, that by using the methods in empirical aesthetics, we can actually also study something about the mind in general, something basic about our psychology and about our brain. Right, so as I say, mostly what we do here, we have people watch dance, whatever that is for each scientist, we still need to define that a bit, but fine. That's why we need, we need to start somewhere. And we look at people's judgments. So we have them rate usually in the lab or outside, how much do they like or, you know, in some scale from zero to 100 or how many stars would you give this performance and so on. And then we're interested in narrowing down what modulates this aesthetic experience that people might have. And a series of variables have been sort of teased apart in the past years, in the first endeavors of this new discipline um, that is only 15 years old. 
Um, for example, the dance type might make a, a difference. Um, the visual shapes, the context, whether or not we have dance expertise ourselves or cultural expertise. Um, our personality might make a difference if we are very open to experience or not. Uh, what about music that plays to it? There are many variables to still study. The cool thing is that, as I said before, someone who has been studying these modulations of the aesthetic judgment is here with us today. It's Beatrice, <laughs> who, ha who was the first to study dance with neuroscientific methods. I remember being an undergraduate student and reading her papers. And today she's here and she will answer our questions. She promised. <laughs> um, and she's particularly interested in how being an expert in dance changes or modulates the way that you perceive aesthetically a dance of another person. Um, so just to give you an overview of the first types of stimuli that were used in empirical studies of dance, um, many of them are from Beatrice, <laughs> slight bias, but there are many others like Corinne Jola and uh, also from uh, Patrick Haggard's lab, some other researchers, Frank Pollack and uh, Emily Cross, of course, and some other researchers from the more Asian continent. Um, what you can see here is the type of stimuli uh, frozen in time because usually they are videos. So what we do, we have have people watch in the lab or in naturalistic settings, maybe in the theater or in a dance performance somehow, uh, so either on the computer or real life, these type of videos, real performances, um, or photos, but usually it's moved. And then at the end, we ask for judgments and we might record brain activity during them or um, heart rate or other physiological um, constants or, how do you say, physiological measures that make sense in our study design. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to speak about Ed here briefly because um, these were the first endeavors, let's say, but obviously a lot of this method was borrowed from the other art domains in this empirical aesthetics field, which are usually static. So um, dance is by its nature temporal, <laughs> so we need some sort of more dynamic measures. And uh, we're very lucky because someone of these visual arts, who was, uh, is quite famous in that field actually, is here with us and he has actually moved into the dance domain and has uh, brought some interesting insights into how we could approach this more dynamically uh, in our experiments. Right, Ed? <laughs> um, so uh, I would just uh, like to do, uh, point uh, your attention to each speaker again. Um, we have Luisa Sanchez Canero from the Dresden Frankfurt Dance Company, a uh, practitioner herself, long years of experience, um, amazing uh, person, and will speak about ex uh, aesthetic expectations on dance. Um, Beatrice, as I said, first to study dance with neuroscientific methods, interested in how dance expertise modulates the way we see dance. And Ed, thankfully joining the venture, usually quite renowned for this work on the default mode network and how we engage with visual arts and now lending his expertise to the dance world. At the end, I will show you some more of my drawings. And uh, usually I'm interested in uh, the field of how dance expertise modulates, modulates emotional sensitivity, but I'll speak to you about some studies about expressivity today.